Welcome to Knowledge Wins, your podcast from the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School and the Special Operations Center of Excellence, where we explore topics to enable a more holistic understanding of the Army Special Operations Forces Schoolhouse and the role of Army Special Operations in the future of national defense. I'm your host, Major Anthony Wirtz, a psychological operations officer by trade and a member of the Commander's Initiatives Group here at the Special Warfare Center and School. What you hear in these episodes are the views of the participants and don't represent those of SWIC, the Army, or any other agency of the U.S. government. Except me, I represent the views of SWIC. Absolutely, sir. Our guest today is no stranger to SWIC or the greater RSOF community. Major General Patrick Roberson is the Special Warfare Center and School Commanding General and the Commandant of the Special Operations Center of Excellence. Today's episode focuses on RSOF lessons learned in Syria. And we're introducing the publication of our newest edition of Special Warfare Magazine, the official professional journal of U.S. Army Special Operations Forces, whose January to March 2021 issue focuses specifically on recounts and lessons learned from recent operations in Syria. Sir, it's been just about a year since you kicked off the first Knowledge Win podcast episode. I'm very glad to have you back with us. Thank you for being here today. My pleasure. Thank you, Anthony. Absolutely, sir. So to start off, and for those in our audience that may not be familiar with your recent past, immediately prior to assuming command of SWIC and the Special Operations Center of Excellence, you commanded Sajidif OIR, the Special Operations Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve, from summer 2018 to summer 2019. At that time, the coalition and their partners in the Syrian Democratic Forces were squeezing ISIS's physical caliphate into their last 200 square miles and eventually to ISIS holding no territory at all. Obviously a very historic period in recent warfare, and one with numerous innovations, which I'm sure you've spent considerable time contemplating in the aftermath. To that end, you authored the issue's opening article entitled, Soft Perspectives on Fighting ISIS in Syria. Before we get into the article itself, do you mind telling us what your most prominent reflection from your time in command there was, or what stands out the most to you? In addition to being the, uh, the Sujidif OIR commander, I got to do two-month trips as a deputy, one in 16 and one in 17, so I got to see the progression uh, of, of our role there. And I, I thought, again, as just SOF in general, because we're, we're part of a joint SOF team over there, I think our, just the overall contribution of SOF, our approach to the fight through the use of partners, and you know the fact that in Iraq we used a partner namely the Iraqi counter-terrorist force that we had built over really a decade plus of war. The fact that we were able to go back to that partner and almost pick up where we left off in 2011, that was a huge piece and that, that force was really the vanguard of the Iraqi security forces in taking back territory from ISIS. You can juxtapose that with our efforts in Syria where Although we'd not fought in Syria before, we were able to partner with a force that became our principal partner. We linked up with this force, which is a Kurdish force, through our Kurdish partners in Iraq. These are the people that helped us meet the, uh, the YPG, which later became the backbone of the SDF and the core of our force that was able to defeat you know, the physical caliphate. So to see the formula that really soft and you know army soft in particular the idea of working by with and through a partner how that worked out for our country how that paid dividends i think in spades that was my most uh, prominent thought coming out of there absolutely how sir how effective that was the persistent partnership is something that uh I think we pride ourselves in yeah. as the RSOF force. Well, there's a persistent partnership piece to it, but there's also, I can almost pick up a partner in mid-stride and make that partner a lot better. Two really kind of different approaches in partnering, but both worked out very well. Absolutely, sir. You note in the article's introduction uh, that that required some complex navigation uh, to prosecute the war to defeat ISIS in Syria especially given the joint and coalition nature of the fight a mixed a proxy warfare sponsored by some of our largest adversaries, particularly Russia and Iran. How does that 
experience or aspect of the experience shed light on the potential solutions to future great power competitions? Or Well, I think that uh, when you talk about competition, I think in, uh, in both Iraq and Syria, but we'll, we'll talk about Syria on this one, if you think about Iranian influence and Russian influence, these people sometimes, like the Iranians, are our direct adversaries. Uh, and sometimes they're just competitors, and the Russians are mainly competing with us. And both of these entities, both the Iranians and their proxies, and the Russians and their proxies, they they didn't like ISIS either. ISIS was not always their number one target because they were they were going after anti-regime forces of any of any stripe. But I will say, one of their main goals was to out compete us and make it look like they were doing a lot of the heavy lifting against ISIS and others or to make us look like we were didn't belong in Syria that what we were doing was was wrong that we were dividing Syria up so there's actually like a physical competition to see who can des- destroy the adversary first and then there's also a narrative competition as to who's doing the most, who's who's causing damage, who's doing what they said they were going to do, who's winning and who's losing, uh, and who who is destroying ISIS. So if you think about that aspect of competition, I, th- I think that aspect of competition always exists. It was just brought to a much, you know, higher level of visibility and activity in Syria. And as we as we closed in on the physical caliphate, which is really in the uh, a southern central corner of Syria, as we got next to each other, both the Iranians and the Russians, things became a little bit even more heated as we as we got into a smaller geographic space uh, with those entities on our on the borders, which could show exactly how a future conflict or competitive space could end up. I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Later in the article, sir, uh, you emphasized the importance of uh, RSOF's forward access and placement, which is most readily maintained by those long-standing or newly established partnerships with indigenous forces that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I remember when I first briefed you on the tactical SIAP company mission, as I understood it, in support of Sajidif OIR, and you told me that in your mind, partnership doesn't equate to one plus one equals two. Rather, a better equation to describe partner-enabled operations synergistic effects is us plus them equals four. How do you feel that manifested uh, as we continued our partnership with the Syrian Democratic Forces, their media cells, and their civil councils? Well, first, I'm going to talk about kind of the the kinetic piece of partnering, and then I'm going to talk about your media cells and, and other things. So first of all, I would say one of the best ways that we partner with people is this idea of a persistent partnership where particularly when we're doing partnership in a combat type of environment where it's very easy for us to partner with a partner force and automatically as soft look at them and say I I see what your strong points are I'm going to compliment you by helping you be stronger in your strong points but also I'm going to fill in on some of the gaps you have whether that's you know, intelligence or fires or anything else. And I'm going to put my effort, you know, into that, helping maybe you visualize the battlefield, giving you some advice on, you know, how to attack, how to plan, when to attack, where to attack, when to defend, etc. when to conduct an offense in coordination with uh, the rest of the coalition, etc. And in that way, when we have a, uh, a partner particularly a highly motivated partner that's good. It is not just us plus them. It's not one plus one equals two. It's uh, one plus one equals 11. I probably said four before, but I would actually say 11 because we can we can get a lot done with a partner whose interests coincide with ours. So that's on the ground combat piece. And we're experts, I think, at figuring out, hey, where you're weak, I can train you, but I can also you know, fill in the gap with other things. And the longer that we work together, the better that we are at operating together and the better uh, we are at accomplishing, you know, our mission. In this case, it was the destruction of, of ISIS. And we only got better uh, with time. 
some partnerships kind of burn out towards the end. I would say our partnerships with both in Iraq with the Iraqi Counter-Terrorist Service and the SDF in Syria only got better with time because, again, it's like a team. The more you work together, the better you become. On the information side and the idea of partnering with a host nation, indigenous media cell, I would say the, the stakes are even higher. My view on information is there does have to be an, a U.S. narrative about what we're doing in certain places. We definitely have to have that. But I also firmly believe that your in, you know, indigenous or host nation partner he has to have a very strong narrative also. And a lot of his narrative can be informed by you, like, hey, this is the bigger picture. Let's think about these things, not not these things. Let's let's always have our priorities in order, partner. Don't worry about petty grievances with other people. Let's transcend that. Let's focus on on defeating the enemy, not other things. I think those are things that we can provide our adversary or our excuse me, our partner when we're talking to them about messaging. We also, just like in the kinetic world, we can provide them a lot of technological advancements, whether it's, hey, this is how you operate in social media. These are the different social media platforms. We can still, you know, we still use leaflets sometimes to get into denied areas. We can use all that stuff. But the partner is very much able to be more nuanced about the culture. He can, he can provide you things, or she as a partner, can provide you things that you would have never thought of. You can even be, we pride ourselves on being regional, regionally aligned and regional experts, but I would say that the micro history of a certain area, that's probably something that we're not going to be as good at as the people that live in that area. They can provide us insights into the, the symbology, again, the history, what words to use, what words not to use, how, how to inflame how to how to figure out what are the weak points of an adversary's argument and how to come at those etc there's it's it's ad nauseum you are probably and just like and your partner can help you as an american craft your narrative as well by saying hey i don't think that's going to you know be well received by this population and how do you you should say it in this way not this way or if we do this act we can capitalize on it in this way messaging is very much about understanding your audience and a partner can help you understand that local audience and without that you're somewhat operating in the blind absolutely sir i think uh you know that the partnership uh cultural nuance you know translates that legitimate messaging as you say to resonate across all the different audiences and the war narratives is something that can never be overlooked. You need to really be able to understand every aspect of it from both directions, partner, your own, the adversaries, and then figure out the the counter narratives to each because there's so many lines of effort across them all or lines of information. Yeah, when when you're up against ISIS who has a extremely good propaganda narrative that's very powerful, I think you have to inoculate yourself and just like if you're running any type of marketing campaign or election campaign, you have to figure out like, I can talk, I'm talking to like the SDF, but they're probably not the, there's a certain population of the SDF, like the Arab population that could be more susceptible to ISIS propaganda. The Kurdish side, maybe not as much because they're probably not going to go over to the ISIS side. There, there are different ways of looking at your target audience and saying, how do I how do I craft my messages for these different areas? While well, kind of keeping the, the thematics the same, but I have to micro-target uh, different areas. And how does how does what I'm doing in Syria play in Iraq? How do, how do all these things, how do I manage them? And maybe we're better as Americans at thinking about, hey, how does it play across a broad, the broad coalition, et cetera. Absolutely key, sir. So, sir, just a moment ago, you mentioned uh, strengthening the partner's strong points and filling in for their lesser points, uh, and then how that burgeons as our partnership grows in time and our familiarity with each other. And that's what I want to hit on here. Uh, There are those other supporting roles that RSOF and the U.S. Joint Force provides to our partners to further enable those combat operations. And in this case, 
I'm talking about joint fires, which you mentioned as well. Yeah. Uh, you drew a significant best practice from your initiative to create strike cells at Echelon, sir. Yeah. Uh, what about RSOF? What qualities, what um, resourcing capabilities enabled that initiative to be so successful, and how does it lend itself to that future competition or conflict question? Well, let me, uh, let me just put this, put this out just to give a little bit of a, a context. You know, at, at its high water mark, the SDF is a maneuver force in the tens of thousands of, uh, of individuals. If you have that number of people that really their greatest weapon system was an AK-47 or maybe a, uh, a heavier machine gun, uh, that's pretty much all they had. And so these folks, besides some RSOF and other types of advisors, you know, sometimes SEAL, sometimes MARSOC advisors on the ground, and maybe some coalition soft every now and then, you had a bunch of people with really small arms. So they are your maneuver force. And you're going against a, a dug-in enemy in ISIS, and ISIS was a pretty formidable you know, adversary. So you need fires for that. And I think the idea of providing your maneuver force and your advisors with you can look at it in a couple of different ways with precision fires to target maybe deep targets such as an illegal oil well that's financing ISIS, a armaments factory, etc. Those are precision deep strikes. We're, we're, we're able to see those and action those as, as soft. I think there's other aspects that go into this too as just an assisting maneuver. If we are attacking a dug-in ISIS battalion, brigade, etc., you know, it's, it's good to use fires to assist in maneuver, and that's what we were having to do. So there's multiple different uses of, of fires, whether you're talking about targeting enemy commanders on a precision strike or, or in other ways of doing it. And the concept of having a strike cell at the lowest level is really the soft ability to control fires and implement them at a, uh, really, at a company level was the lowest level that we had. In, but, and, with plenty of augmentation, I would say. And we were using those strike cells. First of all, it's like the clearinghouse for intelligence and looking for targets and being aware of, hey, where is our partner? Where do we think the enemy's at? What are the targets that we're going after today? And then being able to leverage, you know, all types of joint fires platforms, aviation, artillery, rocket artillery, mortars, ISR platforms that are armed, all the way down to, you know, precision fire, loitering munitions, everything that we had and being able to understand the battlefield and use those fires really for to enable maneuver, but also for precision strike. So the idea of pushing that down to a low level, one of our small teams, usually enabled by a, a JTAC that can control fires on the ground, the idea that you have a very small formation that can control an incredible amount of fires, I think, is a competitive advantage that SOF has that is seldom seen in other you know, formations. And the amount of precision strike, precision fires that we could bring to bear on a battlefield, again, that is one of the things that made the uh, SDF successful. They put a lot of effort into the slog, but the idea of providing the, the fires is a tremendous asset. And I think we've done that. We can do that in multiple places. And as technology increases and the idea of like, I can see more targets through technology, the idea becomes how fast can I action those targets with what weapon system? And I think as, as soft progresses in time, the idea of seeing, being forward, seeing the battlefield and using our platforms for strike capability, I think that's just a huge thing. Absolutely, sir. Uh, some have term, termed that the kill chain, the uh, understand, decide, and act, and uh, mm -hmm. technological advances to speed that, shorten it up, makes a lot of sense. Here in the article, you also discussed another lesson in scalability, uh, a virtual miniaturized task force or company team uh, that being what became known as a cross-functional team or a CFT. It makes me want to launch into a series of questions about the number that were established and the types that were created for which missions where. 
and other type of questions, but it might be easier, sir, uh, if I just ask you what your thought of the practice and execution was, uh, if you think it'll become a lasting operational construct uh, as we move into further competitive spaces. Well, I, I do think it's a lasting construct. I, so in, in Syria in particular, in Iraq it was a little different, but in Syria in particular, most of our cross-functional teams, and I think that we need to kind of parse out how we operate a little bit, we could basically say at the core of a lot of these teams, there was a, an SF ODA, and we had augmented a lot of those with civil affairs and PSYOP, but I wouldn't stop there because most of those, those SF teams or operational detachments also had like JTAC augmentation, right? For joint fires, they had EOD, you know, ordnance disposal folks with them. They had SIG enters, signals intelligence with them. They had sometimes even radar technicians for figuring out, hey, where's enemy artillery coming in? A lot of, there was some PAO. So I think that you could look at a cross-functional team and just say that you could cross you could organize, task organize for combat at any level. If you if you went up a level to an AOB, our company level, you would have seen that there was a lot of logistical support at those levels. If you went up to a battalion level, there was aviation support. So all these ways are just organizing, in my opinion, task forces for combat. I'd say sometimes in the RSOF community, when we talk about cross-functional team, we talk about civil affairs, and PSYOP and Special Forces. And I think that's that's a good way to talk about things. I think that, that works well in a competition type environment. But when you get into combat, I think you have to think about, hey, how do I augment a team or a company in other ways that make it more survivable? And I'll also say that it, sometimes in combat, sometimes civil affairs and PSYOP, the best place for them to be maybe at different echelons, depending on where you're at, maybe th for them to be more effective. The most effective place for certain assets is not always at the tip of the spear, although it can be. So I think we have to figure out, hey, what's the best place? I can't, I can't look at the cross-functional team concept and say it's always a one-size-fits-all, or that it's a cookie-cutter kind of approach. I think all these things are very different. And it worked out very well for us, I think, in Syria, and I'll just I'll compare Syria and Iraq a little bit because it's an interesting comparison. In Iraq, we were not allowed to have any civil affairs on any of our teams in Iraq because the Iraqi government was very much about, we actually have this, we don't need civil affairs, we've got this under, under control. In Syria, that was different because the Syrian Democratic Forces, although super good at creating their own kind of a rolling government as we took terrain back, they very much welcomed our, the presence of civil affairs and those civil affairs individuals that we had on those cross-functional teams were instrumental in establishing, helping to establish civic councils where a certain type of representative government was formed in the wake. And I'll, and I'll just say, as you're waging this war against ISIS, establishing order and establishing some type of governance in the wake uh, and security, that was one of the hardest jobs that we had. And civil affairs folks were instrumental in making that happen along with our with our partners establishing a ministry of reconstruction justice education picking up the trash all these things that are of utmost importance to a local population which which if you don't have that will lead to unrest and all of your gains will be undone rather quickly just in closing i think the cross functional team concept is probably something that we've always been doing in the la over the course of time in war scalability is one of the things that makes SOF unique. It's another competitive advantage. We can scale down to almost a singleton, all the way up to a pretty large CFT, depending on what's going on. I think that our challenge as we go into like the future would be don't get stuck on just one version of cross functional team because really it's task organized for combat or competition or my regional area or however I like it. Again, what we did in Iraq we had different a different look than what we were doing. Same end result, destruction of ISIS, but we used different cross-functional team organizations to, to get it done. 
or just task organized differently? I couldn't agree more, sir. I think um, the, the flexible scalability is key, and I think you're obviously right that we've been doing this for a long time, just uh, trying to maybe codify it a little bit more now. But uh, to your point about civil affairs and their importance in the, uh, in the governance, representative uh, governance uh, in the wake of ISIS, um, you, you gave me, uh, my CFT, uh, a civil affairs team in, uh, in INISA, and I, I can't talk about how, uh, how helpful and successful that synergy was while we were trying to not only work with the, the media operations uh, for the SDF, but also work with uh, establishing uh, information operations for their, their civil councils. Huge, sir. You closed your article, sir, drawing observations that the great power competition shows echoes of the Cold War. In that, rather than entering armed conflict for an international issue, the U.S. engaged in greater regional competition against its contemporary adversaries, much like we see occurring today. Why do you feel that SOF is such a strategic asset in uh, these global inter and interregional contexts? Well, again, we talked about scalability and adaptability being part of our competitive advantage as SOF as we go out there. And I'll just kind of explain as we go into this, the brave new world of competition and, and the way that, that I see it. I usually, when I talk about this, I go back to the Cold War, as you said, Anthony, and I talk about what type of actual wars were fought in the Cold War. These wars were usually proxy-type wars. These these were actually the wars that special forces were born out of and PSYOP. If you think about the Vietnams, the Nicaragua, all these kinds of smaller wars that usually large-scale combatants used to engage each other on an, on an open battlefield head-to-head. -head. That doesn't seem to happen as much. Could happen. I don't deny that. But I think our forte is in some of these smaller conflicts that occur on the edges of great power competition and we're ready for that. That's kind of the scene setter for how I would see great power competition. It manifests itself in a lot of different ways. So why do I think that we as SOF are well suited to this? I'm going to go back to agility and I'm going to say that when you see us as a, a tool or a player on a field that we can play many different roles on the field. If you think about one role to be played on the field is competition, right? We're always in competition with our, you know, great power rivals that are out there. We're always competing. And when we're competing with somebody, I think we're competing with them globally, which we're aligned regionally, so we can compete all over the globe with our adversaries, whether it's through partnerships with local individuals or any type of other competitive environment. We're regional and we can go down to the lowest level and basically show the flag and show, hey, this is what America is about, this is what we care about, this is what we can bring you know, to bear on behalf of your nation or cause. So I think in competition, you know, we, we are one of the best tools that our government has. If you go back to the Cold War, and I talked about how does the Cold War manifest itself in a kinetic way, it's usually proxy wars smaller scale wars of national liberation, wars of rebellion, etc. That's also an area where we excel because as we just talked about in the Syria and Iraq model, our idea of working with partners and bringing a scalability of presence to a battle, we don't have to have a large footprint, we can have a very small footprint and have an outsized role in that. I completely believe that in those types of wars, we also are an extremely valuable tool, again, one of our great competitive advantages. If we ever had to go to a large-scale ground combat type operation, I believe that our utility were value added there also. I think the idea of unconventional warfare, building partners deep in an enemy area or to the periphery, that is something that we have proven time and again that we can do even on the fly and have great results come out of it uh, on the battlefield. So I personally don't see any area, competition, conflict, proxy type wars, or any other type of war that's out there where we would not play a prominent role. 
that's how that's how I see it, Anthony. I appreciate the catch, sir. I failed to ask you about large-scale ground combat operations. I'm going to give you the last comment and last word here, okay. like I like to close out, to make sure I haven't missed anything else, sir, in your okay. mind for this topic. But before I do, I want to make sure that I put the last plug in for this particular issue coming out. Again, focused on Syria. Special Warfare Magazine has the the CG's article, as we just discussed, and about nine other articles uh, all across the breadth of our operations in uh, Operation Inherent Resolve to include authors from Special Forces, Civil Affairs, and Psychological Operations. Well, sir, that's my plug, so anything I missed, anything you think I, I would just to- uh, I would just close out with by saying I think it's going to be a very good Special Warfare Magazine edition. I think that the fight in both Iraq and Syria, although this one is focused on Syria, is a pretty recent case study in how we can apply ourselves at scale against maybe an adversary that's not a, he's not a great power competitor, but he is he's a competitor nonetheless. And I think we had some setbacks, we had some significant wins, and we have to look at it. As I tell everybody that's here in the Special Warfare Center in school, we have to understand where we've been, right? Just to know where we're going. We have to know where we've been. We have to know what we learned, what we did well, what we didn't do well. And we have to figure out in the future, hey, how am I or how are we going to apply the things that we learned into the future? And I think that's what this magazine uh, edition is going to give us. Absolutely, sir. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, sir. I appreciate all the insights. Till next time, stay safe out there. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, remember, knowledge wins.